Good morning and welcome to Worship with Mountain Shadows Presbyterian Church on this Sunday, May 24th, 2020, the seventh Sunday in the season of Easter. Forty days after celebrating the resurrection of the Lord, near the conclusion of the season of Easter, Christians commemorate the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. On this day in particular, we give thanks for Christ's sovereign rule over all creation, as well as his intercession for us at the throne of God's mercy. We proclaim with joy that Jesus is already Lord of heaven and earth and head of the church, and we watch with longing for the day when he will come again in the glory of God's new creation. Let us pray. Almighty God, your blessed Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, ascended far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Mercifully, give us faith to trust that as Jesus promised, he abides with us on earth to the end of time. We pray in Jesus' name, trusting that he lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Together, let us worship God. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. Jesus Christ opens our minds so we can comprehend the meaning of the scriptures. This is what the scriptures say, that the promised one, the anointed one Jesus, suffered and rose from the dead on the third day. In his name, a radical change of thought and life is possible. In his name, the forgiveness of sins is offered to us. Jesus lifts up his hands and blesses his people. Let us worship him with joy-filled hearts. Let us lift up our hearts and celebrate God. Amen. Hear the call to confession. You and I can throw all our anxieties onto God because God cares about us. Trusting in the Holy One of Peace, let us pray.
We bow down, O God. We humble ourselves, trusting that in time you will lift us up. We know that you care for us, carry for us our burdens and worries. When pressures mount and our stresses increase, we find it hard to practice our faith. When anxiety gets the better of us, we feel threatened as by a prowling enemy. Strengthen our spirits, we pray. Bolster our resistance. Remind us of others throughout the world who suffer and work through us so our lives may be a blessing to them. Call us to your everlasting presence, O God. Through Jesus, support us, restore us, strengthen and ground us. All power belongs to you, O God, now and forever. Amen. Hear the words of assurance. We are blessed. The Spirit of God rests on us. The God of all grace, who called us into eternal glory in Jesus Christ, restores, empowers, strengthens, and establishes us. To God be the glory and praise forever and always. Amen. A Reflection on the Peace of Christ by Christopher Rodkey Christians proclaim the peace of Christ and believe in an ultimate hope, even as we experience suffering and destruction around us. Peace is not a heaven beyond space and time, not distant or even in another dimension, but deeply present in the immediate reality of now. Such hope gives us assurance and a deeper and more real participation in the living presence of God. This hope gives us peace, because it is a universal gift to humanity. May the peace of the risen Christ be with us all.
Last Sunday, I preached a sermon on a passage from 1 Peter. Today, I'm inviting us back into that same New Testament letter, but a different passage from it. Before I read verses from chapters 4 and 5 of 1 Peter, I'm going to give you a sense of the letter's background because we need always to remember that for all of its timeless themes and applicability to our own lives, the Bible was not written exclusively for us and our generation. The Bible was written for various ancient communities. Our understanding of Scripture is enriched when we learn something about those ancient communities. We can draw comparisons between them and our own time and place, and we can notice differences between their worlds and our own. We can listen for the ways that the scriptures speak divine wisdom to us here and now without losing sight of the fact that they are also historical sacred documents. To appreciate the ancient yet living character of the scriptures is to experience them as an inspired word of God. Briefly, the first century background of 1 Peter is this. A writer, maybe more than one writer, who claimed the name Peter wrote a letter to multiple churches of the region then called Asia Minor, now called modern Turkey. The people of these churches were new Christians. They were converts to Christianity from the mainstream pagan religion of the time. Some of these new Christians were enslaved people. Many were women. They were, as a commentator named David Bartlett puts it, among the marginalized people of Asia Minor living at the edges of power and prestige. So they were underdogs culturally, a religious minority whom the writer of First Peter refers to, at an earlier point in the letter, as aliens and exiles. As we're about to hear and read, these Christians were under fire. They were living through a time of crisis that would test them and test their faith in God. Now, let's honor these strong early forebears of our faith as we also listen for God's word for us today. A reading from the first letter of Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory, which is the Spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that God may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on God, because God cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary the devil prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To God be the power forever and ever. 
Amen. Well, it reads like a sermon, doesn't it? Complete with the Amen at the end. The passage begins with trouble. It ends with God's goodness and glory. And in between, there's meaning in Christ and plenty of practical, faithful advice for Christians struggling to keep steadfast faith during a time of trial. And that describes us sometimes these days, Christians struggling to keep the faith during a time of trial. To be clear, the trials we're going through are different from those of the maligned Christian minority of first century Asia Minor living under the oppressive regime of the Roman Empire. But none of us can miss the fact that, politically speaking, these are trying times, divided times, volatile times, and some segments of the human population are suffering persecution and violence undeservedly, unjustly. For example, the racially motivated murder of Ahmad Arbery, an unarmed black man who was jogging in Georgia in February when two white men allegedly chased him and gunned him down, reminds us painfully that in our own nation, in our own time, too many people can still be described as those ancient Christians have been described among the marginalized people living at the edges of power and prestige. As a person who enjoys a great deal of social privilege and economic security, I need always to remember that one person's or one community's privilege is, in too many ways, based on the underprivileging of others. And that's not holy justice. That's not the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, all people are equally welcomed, included, beloved, and honored. When we pray, Thy kingdom come, or Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, we're calling on God to empower us to make real in this world the divine realm of justice, peace, and shalom, where nobody is made to live or die at the edges of power and prestige. For a few days, the recent arrest of two men allegedly responsible for the murder of Ahmad Arbery shifted national attention away from constant pandemic news and reminded us of the hard work that lies before us, not only in the arenas of sickness, health, and health care, but also in the struggle for social justice, racial justice. Because that struggle is so very real, the Presbyterian Church USA has named the dismantling of structural racism as one of our chief goals as a Christian denomination. To quote the language of the Presbyterian Mission Agency, racism is anti-Christian. In 2016, the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA approved a comprehensive church-wide anti-racism policy called Facing Racism, a Vision of the Intercultural Community. The policy states Racism is a lie about our fellow human beings, for it says that some are less than others. It is also a lie about God, 
for it falsely claims that God favors parts of creation over the entirety of creation. Because of our biblical understanding of who God is and what God intends for humanity, the Presbyterian Church USA must stand against, speak against, and work against racism. Anti-racist effort is not optional for Christians. It is an essential aspect of Christian discipleship without which we fail to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ is good news for all people. Yet Christians of this present day who work to dismantle racism and make this a good news world for all people are sometimes reviled for doing so. Preachers who preach against racism are sometimes told to tone it down because it's not a pleasant, palatable topic. Christians who criticize public policies that discriminate against non-white communities are sometimes told that they're being too edgy, too confrontational, too controversial. Maybe that's happened to you. Maybe you don't just go along to get along. Maybe you've been silenced or intimidated because your expression of Christian discipleship, your proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ, is challenging to the status quo. And maybe when you've spoken out to say, something's wrong here, some systems in this world are corrupt and look nothing like the kingdom of God, you've gotten some hard pushback. At times like that, the ancient words of First Peter can seem to shed all the cultural accrual of 20 centuries and speak with freshness and pointed relevance right to the heart of our 21st century lives and times. Hear those words again. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory, which is the Spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that God may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on God, because God cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. Whether the adversary takes the form of the religious persecution of the earliest Christians in Asia Minor, or it takes the form of white supremacists in the United States, that adversary is on the prowl it is an expression of evil. It is a fomenter of destructive, fiery ordeals. The Christian's calling, therefore, is a call to resistance, a call to bold hope in Jesus Christ, not passive, do-nothing hope that waits helplessly for the divine repairman to come and fix what human beings have broken, but courageous and even joyful hope that knows the Spirit of God is resting on the shoulders of the righteous, and even if we don't see justice done in our lifetimes, 
God will see justice done in the fullness of time. In the meantime, the Christian's task, our task, yours and mine, is to maintain steadfast faith in God Almighty and do the justice and peacemaking work that is ours to do in spiritual solidarity with our brothers and sisters in all the world who are undergoing all kinds of suffering. Let us pray. God of all grace, you have called your people to eternal glory in Christ, and you have promised to restore, support, strengthen, and establish humankind by your mighty and merciful hand. We proclaim Christ is Lord of the world and head of the church. Because he has ascended, there are no other rulers. All others are merely pretenders. Christ reigns supreme, and that matters as much to all social and political systems as Christ's ascension matters to the church. With the raising of Christ to a position above all worldly powers, the earthly ministry begun at his birth is fulfilled. Help us, O God, to follow his path of faithfulness, aware that he traveled through the suffering of the cross to exaltation and glory. From glory to suffering to glory again is the shape of Jesus' ministry as well as ours. We too are destined for the glory we now share with Christ by faith. When we say he ascended into heaven and is seated at your right hand, O God, we affirm that Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, heals the wounds of a broken humanity and breaks down the walls that divide us from each other and from you. In ascending, Jesus gave his message and his mission to us and to all his disciples. His story and work are now in the care and keeping of his followers, with the promised gift of your Holy Spirit, we will be able to continue Jesus' work, remaining ever steadfast in our faith. In that same faith, we lift up to you now all of our prayers for the world, for communities in need, for the families of the earth, for our own loved ones, and for ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray, O God, in the name of Jesus, together with disciples of every time and place, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Mountain Shadows Presbyterian Church is a four-for-four four congregation of the Presbyterian Church USA. What does that mean? It means that we are a congregation that participates in all four special offerings of our denomination. Those special offerings are one great hour of sharing, the Pentecost offering, the Peace and Global Witness offering, and the Christmas Joy offering. Next Sunday, May 31st, 2020, will be Pentecost Sunday. That's the Sunday when we receive the Pentecost offering that supports ministries with and for youth and young adults of our denomination and beyond. Mountain Shadows in particular supports the Young Adult Volunteers Ministry of the Presbyterian Church USA. So I invite you to bear in mind those yavs as you watch this Minute for Mission about the Pentecost offering. For years, researchers have highlighted the importance of early life experiences for brain and social development. In a similar way, many congregations realize how important Christian formation is during the first third of life from childhood through young adulthood. Children, youth, and young adults develop their spiritual moorings through supportive communities, caring mentors, and faith-related nurture and service. Gifts to the Pentecost offering support your congregation's efforts of faith formation in the first third of life, with 40% of proceeds staying in your congregation, while 60% is used to support national initiatives of our denomination focused in the area. The Pentecost offering makes a difference for the life of the whole church and for congregations like yours. In Rochester, New York, Third Presbyterian Church is passionate about Christian formation during this critical first third of life. Reverend Lynette Dirksen Sparks, Third Presbyterian's Associate Pastor of Outreach and Evangelism says, the Pentecost offering just made sense to us. It is aligned with so much of the work that we are already involved in. One young adult whose faith formation began at Third Presbyterian has continued her journey of discipleship through the Presbyterian Young Adult Volunteer Program. She served this past year in Asheville, North Carolina, assisting an organization that builds houses with and for low-income individuals. Though her volunteer year has concluded, she's still continuing this work. The YAV program is made possible by your gifts to the Pentecost offering. You provide young people with a year of service for a lifetime of change. The offering also sends students to the Presbyterian Youth Triennium, Jane Carden, Youth Ministry Coordinator, says, Triennium is all about establishing relationships and connections. Jane has led the delegation of the Genesee Valley Presbytery three different times. She's listened to many youth who have found their voice at the event and developed the ability to lead and share their faith when they return home. This impact is important for all students but especially for those from smaller congregations in the presbytery, kids who have limited opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer relationships within their congregation. In addition to spiritual development, the Pentecost offering supports student achievement in local school systems, a key building block of success that is formed within the first third of life. For more than 30 years, Third Presbyterian has capitalized on the expertise of school teachers and professors within its membership to provide a successful tutoring program. More recently, the congregation has organized community groups and equipped families to advocate for improvement in the city's school system. Addressing root causes of poor academic achievement in the United States is a major commitment of the Educate a Child, Transform the World initiative, a denomination-wide effort that is supported by our gifts to the Pentecost offering. This initiative equips and connects Presbyterian congregations that seek to advance learning through public schools. Just like Third Presbyterian Church, your congregation supports the Pentecost offering to help people begin life with a strong start. A solid foundation of faith and learning formed from childhood to young adulthood enables individuals to weather life's storms and to build on life's opportunities. Your congregation and our church's national ministries are helping to shape the future of children, youth, and young adults. The Pentecost offering 
helps people in the first third of life reach their fullest potential, both now and in the future. Thank you for your generosity and support. May 26th, 2020 will be Memorial Day. Official Memorial Day observances in our nation date back to the Civil War era. The tradition of decorating graves of war dead in the spring dates back centuries. As our nation observes this Memorial Day, may we remember the over 1.2 million citizens who have given their lives in service to this nation. Let us pray. Holy God, your love is stronger than death, and your life-giving power has no end. We commend to your eternal care all who have died in the service of others, even as we lament the violence of war. Comfort and sustain all those who mourn. Heal the wounded body, mind, and spirit. Bring justice, freedom, and dignity to all people, and bring an end to war throughout the earth, so that all may know your promised peace, through Christ, the resurrection and the life. Amen. Clap your hands, all you peoples. God has gone up with a shout of joy. The Lord Jesus Christ is risen to reign. His is the name above all names. We are witnesses. The Lord is risen. Christ has ascended to reign on high. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Together let God's people say, Amen. <laughs>